So just a couple of words before I hand things over to Ray Armentrout. Ray, and Armin, Ray Armentrout and I, Jean Huving, started this series uh, almost two months ago now in response to the sheltering in place. We considered to create an enclave, namely a space and time apart in which we listen very closely to one writer. And we also try to give significant introductions or at least good introductions to the writers as part of what Charles Bernstein might call close listening. So um, we're very happy with the Enclave series. Unfortunately, it transpires in this modality on Zoom, but it is really great to see many faces. So good to see everyone here. If you aren't familiar with Zoom, uh, I'm assuming most of you are by now, you have two options, personal options. You can go up to the far right corner and you can hit gallery view or you can hit speaker view. For instance, if you're tired of looking at my face as the main thing you see, if you hit gallery view, you know, it's actually an inverse, it's kind of a crazy um, messaging that they do. If you hit speaker view, you'll go to gallery view. So um, tired of one big face, go to gallery view and you'll see the other people that are here. We are looking forward to more enclave readings. In June, we have John Yao, Bob Perelman, and Lainey Brown. Uh, in July and August, we have Peter Gizzi, Joseph Donahue, Lissa Walsack, and Charles Bernstein, and a couple of others that we are waiting for confirmations. So I hope you will join us on other Sundays, same time, same place. We give out different Zoom addresses for each month. So if you have the Zoom address for this month, you're good to go for June and July. We will be changing it again. Okay, so um, I am happy to turn over the unmuted mic to <laughs> Ray Armentrout, who needs no introduction. Uh, she does have a forthcoming book, Conjure from Wesleyan, and it should be out this fall. Her preceding book was Wobble. Uh, she is Professor Emeritus at UCSD. We bring you this from the shores of Puget Sound. Uh, even though we could be across the country from each other, somehow the conjunction of living in the Seattle area uh, has meant that we've done a few things together, which has been really terrific. So here is Ray. Thank you, Jean. Okay, um, unlike some of the other people I've introduced for this series, Ed Roberson is not an old friend of mine, sadly, but I very much enjoyed hearing him and speaking with him on the few occasions we have met. The last of those was the Entanglements Conference at Wake Forest University, which explored the intersections between science and poetry. I think that trying to summarize what a poet writes about is often reductive. Of course, the crisis of race in America has been on Roberson's mind and in his work, but so has the climate crisis and the destruction of ecosystems. These two horrors can, of course, be seen as part of the same thing, whether we call that thing exploitative capitalism or short-sighted stupidity. They both involve an unwillingness to respect other beings and recognize the ways in which we are all interdependent. Ed Roberson has published many books of poetry, most recently, To See the Earth Before the End of Time, which was from Wesleyan in 2010, and Closest Pronunciation, published by Northwestern University Press in 2013. His forthcoming books include Asked What Has Changed, also to come out from Wesleyan, and Miles Per Hour, The Motorcycle Poems, from Verge Publications, and that'll be out later this year. 
He is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Ruth Lilly Pegasus Award from the Poetry Foundation, the Penn Volker Award for Poetry, and most recently, the Jackson Prize for Poetry. He is Professor Emeritus in Northwestern's MFA Creative Writing Program and has been an instructor for the Cave Canon Retreat for Black Writers and has, has served as the Holloway Visiting Professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Nathaniel Mackey has praised the way Roberson's, quote, lab labyrinthine, syntactically double-jointed lines work at a nervous disconsolate pitch, peculiar insight and double angle, which is something I appreciate. I first became engaged with his work when I read his 2010 book, To See the Earth Before the End of the World. This book brings home the kind of double angle Mackey is referring to here, it balances the mo this, his book balances the momentary time of the world with its multiple mortal perspectives against the deep time of the earth. The title poem of this collection begins with a sadly accurate take on our modern addiction to spectacle, even when it is the spectacle of our own destruction. So to quote, people are grabbing at the chance to see the earth before the end of the world the world's death piece by piece, each longer than we. Some endings of the world overlap our lived time, skidding for generations to the crash scene of species extinction, the five minutes it takes for the plane to fall. These lines are a visceral enactment of the collision of different time frames and of our modern tendency to think we are in control of it all, even as we grab and skid. We may be in the driver's seat, but the car is going off the cliff. I've recently also had the privilege of reading Roberson's forthcoming book, Asked What Has Changed, which will be out from Wesleyan next year. Roberson's answer to the title question is everything. Quote, even staring out the window has changed. Recent calamities in this forthcoming book are indicators, the devastating fires in the West, the monster storms in the East, the police brutality against black people everywhere, the unrest in the streets. These threats flicker here in a giddy panorama. No poet is more attuned than Ed Roberson to what it feels like to live in a world skidding out of control. The poems explore the liminal spaces, disaster opens up. And so I'm pleased to present Ed Roberson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, and uh, thank all these folks who are showing up for this. Uh, good to see these faces again. Um, I don't know whether uh, it's the same in um, other parts of the country, but in Chicago, besides what's going on, <laughs> Today is um, Brooks Day, Gwendolyn Brooks Day. Um, it's the 100th anniversary of her birth. Um, so uh, it should be Brooks Day across the country, but here in Chicago, that also is going on. So one of the things I wanted to do, um, everybody's influenced by, by Gwendolyn Brooks. And... Um, I wanted to read one of her poems, and later on I'll read one of my own. Um, and and, and uh, I wanted to read also another poet, I'll read one of his, uh, and uh, then I'll continue and, and read a bunch of my own things. But I wanted to open up with uh, um, a call to, the, uh, to your attention. Of, the, of these two poets. Um, the Gwendolyn Brooks poem I wanted to read is called Truth. And, and, and happily today, it's the one they put on the uh, Poetry Foundation website honoring her. I'll read Truth. If son comes, how shall we greet him? Shall we not dread him? Shall we not fear him after so lengthy a session or shade? Though we have wept for him, though we have prayed all through the night years, 
What if we wake one shimmering morning to hear the fierce hammering of his fierce knuckles hard on the door? Shall we shudder? Shall we not flee into the shelter? The dear, thick shelter of the familiar, propitious haze? Sweet it is, sweet it is, to sleep in the coolness of snug unawareness. The dark hangs heavily over our eyes. Gwendolyn Brooks. The other part I wanted to start with is um, Gil Scott Heron. Uh, I, I'm, I get credited or, or plucked into the folks who write about nature. And uh, one of the poems I really used to love to teach, um, along with the regular teaching poems, was this one. This is called Winter in America. And it's Gil Scott Heron. And I always sort of pointed out to folks, it has all the elements <laughs> that we have to teach to the, you know, as a, as a winter in America. From the Indians who welcomed the pilgrims to the buffalo who once ruled the plains. Like the vultures circling beneath the dark clouds looking for the rain looking for the rain. From the seas that stagger on the coastlines, you all remember this? <laughs> In a nation that just can't take much more, like the forest buried beneath the high waste, never had a chance to grow, never had a chance to grow. It's winter in America, and all the healers have been killed or forced away. It's winter in America, and ain't nobody fighting. Nobody knows what to say. Uh, Y'all remember that uh, from uh, those days. Well, old nature poet here has his version of a couple of these things. Uh, the other morning, I usually get up at sunrise. The other morning, I was fixing an egg and I looked out at the lake. And uh, we got this poem. Their daily yoke. Their daily yoke, yep. Funny, that little yoke, sunny side up in the span of the lake. Every morning for breakfast bubbles up, what? Great hen lays this egg on us, on us. Now that's funny. This burden of respect. What shining flight or light are we to prove our ancestry with the sun? What throwback are we to cook up? That was my answer this week to Brooks. And my answer to Joe Scott is always hard to deal with. Summer's song, trophy, faraway trains, distant planes, the din permeating streets of traffic sounds, but summer coming round rings up the close ruckus of the landscapers. Lawn mowers the size of unnoised, regulated small cars, go karts, stand up motorcycles, the walkabout edgers, the angry cutting blowers all day cut off any sound of birds. We yell to each other our song of greeting, any conversation impossible. The city municipally advertising of its green broadcasts over tax. Perception numb, 
horizon to horizon and history. Horizon to horizon, the guns draw on what we're too easily known for, the poor drawing on their own in drive-by, showdown, or any run gone bad, the empty handing over only more empty, the boarding up another store. A different kind of overburden still does not respond. A silence, all so clear, but unconnected to its senses, its sheer turning away, making deeper, more deviant, a kill. Trees kept so in line, they all die at once, whole planted blocks. Lawns without temperature, range of tolerance, go brown and die before the black bitter earth receives its reign of promise. The promise, this contradictions of droughts reigns us into this noise and stillness, this not listening and not being heard, that this too much and empty be brought harmony should rule our compass into that circle of self containment of which the rainbow, the ark has always been all of our sign, our covenant with the larger whatever below the horizon out of sight that we not forget we are hooked back into even what we neglect of the lost body found neath the driving wheel, its books, the profit of it, the baby born to the mother of food that has to be fed. Noise complaint. I hear it, but what is the instrument that voices the flashing red light strain, which no rung gauge twisting the possible could and not implode out of existence? We all know. I have a few things that need said. No humans have gone without saying how hard and deep a deal this being has cut. The sun rises straight down the hall on the bathroom mirror bevel, rides the walls waving prismatic rainbow, festoons straddle the edges of doors, orgasmic knees crunch, a prayer spectrum compressed to screaming brilliance. But minutes later, no food, no money to move, your shit piled in the middle of the floor for eviction. Antisophy. The driving arm of the cello section runs, the white hot lightning strokes headlong, tearing out the track as the wave the music goes. The unescapable rhythm smoking situation sounds like what it's playing. These people barely afford a tune to train a composer over continual abyss, not species for flight, no air, but over a heated scream. One old blue sounding line hums up some shit, so deep, the very chaos of it all fell in for the time, being a sooted black life suited the burning cities, the streets, fashioned of the latest survival, that hot hit. <laughs> Ship of state. Some people in this country find themselves below the surface of a content that never intends to fill any container, not even full or otherwise, just black. 
of content meant to this country empty always, no matter how full the content of our character, the national scape will go to through its history of white horn blaring, blaming, to strumpet every obedience to every achievements, virtuous goal the U.S. aimed for in its union, a surface everyone sees but cannot float the national vessel. A counterfeit of waves that can't define themselves into what holds up their ideals, even when they happen besides themselves, the obvious neighborhood living out right next door, not an example they'll take home, but rather burn a Tulsa down to trump that. The trauma back in circulation, fighting for survival again, instead of the correction working together again. The corrections, not in the laws, words, but the heads of the interpreters in the honest unnegotiation of the compromises of the principle. There is a place in me for air as part of me, of a peace with how I live. And I am in it making sense like a cart. We are each other's horses before, given, loaded with flowers, both our breaths of fragrance, of sound, wave, and beat, word of the heart. The music goes on to explain. It is moved by the feet, taking the place apart into other places to see. Where is the surface of the air impresses upon what forms bounce into shape and form, patterns of doing the way they do that they be themselves, ourselves, scattered across the drumhead, shod with the vibration of the unsaid. Geometries of the air, shod with the vibration of the unsaid, dance out their ordered sentences of freedom to freedom, the felt articulated into action, a balletic step that seeing trails resemblances of not knowing to knowing, of silence to song, of being bound to flight, a place in the air achieved, space, not even awake, the speaking might be music, or that the place of air in us might be singing, the fragrance of the flowers already worded, in stone, the airy cupolas of temples, lifted off into the idea of showers, of bubbled light, and the poem as champagne of what the body has bottled in its strain. Um, Eric Satie has uh, one of his compositions is called Cold Peace, Cold Peace. Um, a cold, um, musicians sometimes say cold start. Uh, this is a cold start. Fallen into the Blues River, a Van Gonius monk, the singer didn't even have to swim. He simply was sunk deeper than he already was. His ear was already long gone, which was what they were singing that night in the church under the pinwheeling stars, the blues, stroke like a river, or brush, danced, river. His ear was wandering off in the gunfire, looking for its pieces it wanted only again to hear. The gun shines sun echoing so long, it becomes the sound of war. Had to put on the black American galoshes to drown, bleeding out. It came out blue, the coat 
split his lip, not squished out. He came back and finished the set on 52nd. The headache, concentric rings around the marquee lights spinning, picking up a bebop speed, looking for a fix where no dark clouds roll. He got the train. This is history. Um, Miles Davis was taking a break uh, outside a club on 52nd, and the police told him to move on, and he didn't, and the police beat him and took him into the um, police station. Um, but he came back with a split lip and finished the set. <laughs> Um, Jean, how much time do I have left? Uh, 20 minutes, 25. Okay. If you want to take it, it's great to hear. Um, these are, um, <laughs> These are from 20 aquarium works. Um, uh, I'll read uh, four or five. I'll read about six of them. Uh, aquarium works. I, I was a diver at um, the um, public aquarium in uh, Pittsburgh, the Aqua Zoo. Um, and um, sort of like Frank O'Hare's lunch poems, these are like um, remembering what goes on at work uh, only about 40 years later. <laughs> uh, 20 Aquarium Works. When a shipment from the Amazon arrived out of quarantine, we ran up to watch it from the roof, crest the hill from the airport, and lined up to help unload it to the, to the tanks. The piranha dove to the bottom of plastic bag and bit the shit out of Bob's hand. Everyone remembers George's eyes when the shippers handed him a Cayman alligator to carry. The new world sound of Herbie feeding his rattlesnake sent me down the hall. But George, it drew him like a smell of bacon. And here he was, the taped mouth longer than his arm of a crocodile or alligator or whatever in his arms. When the Herpenix Society met at our site, we got a commendation for best U.S. piranha exhibit, all three species, more than 50, without eating each other in 24 hours in one tank. I fed those little fuckers for weeks up to the meeting. When they're breeding, colors lit up. I got worried, but they were too satisfied to even feel challenged and put off eating each other to narrow the vine fullness for a mate and ate into the abstract rhomboids and blacks and reds, prizes for themselves, how breeding shape can be, the colors of just beautifully healthy. Those are the three species of piranha. Um, the uh, red, black, and white species. Um, the uh, the bla uh, black piranhas are big, um, huge teeth. The rhomboids are the whites, and they're uh, the white piranhas. Uh, they're rhomboid shaped, um, not like the black and the reds, which are big, blunt headed ones. Um, but they didn't eat each other. <laughs> if people are fed, they don't eat each other. 
blind as that, Trump, asshole. In the city where the penguins are, the prize mascot of the champion hockey team, I hated those dumb little stuffed uniforms, so they transferred me somewhere else. The Emeralds, Boa, did not declare the blue, and pinks it smuggled in its design green. Compilation more P than emerald. Nothing we understood except as deterrence within which dazzling light you allowed it to swallow you. Which made more sense than standing in a tuxedo, waiting for someone to slap your mouth with a fish. Having been a feeder, how we feed, the goal determines a lot with me. We had freshwater porpoises rather than saltwater porpoises. We had the river river porpoises. Uh, there's a the, this talks about the legend associated with with river porpoises. Where the porpoises come from, the story has it they are people of the river who come to land. The night of a full moon, like a moonlight cichlid. In its breeding colors, they dazzle to a stand, still anyone near the water's edge and fuck them over. As that light on the water does to the seduce all these millennia, children hiding its bright breathing hole in a foam of flower suds. When I arrive on shift change each full moon, Bob would ask the crew if anyone wanted overtime to stay and watch Eddie, you know how he is all the time. I'm fascinated by the stories. Everyone knows no one on a job has the least doubt. I suit up my equipment, always listening for the water to speak up. I probably left with a breathing hole on the top of my head that I cover with the flowers of story. I never thought to look always open to what, as the story is told, keeps us alive. When I left with this other job I have now, with swimming through some days, leaves me awash on the rim edge of a tank overflow not a bank waiting, beauties open to hold each other's breath, each of our world's life, opening, hip talking the other. I never thought what songs, what stories disappear and re enter the river new now. Moon, moon, tell me I'm listening. Listen. The institutional electrician was called in to fix the lightning over the electric eel tank. Burned out, he left something and the whole fixture fell into the tank. He panicked, he killed the specimen and ran for the tankman, me. When I saw under the debris, the eel squirming on impulse, I grabbed a net to loosen its load which, if thanks, it released into me 200 volts. This limbless body extends beyond its eel into water. The hand of water shakes me. It's thanks harder than it doesn't know. We don't shake through a net of non-conductive rope on a metal pole yet. The electrician went wider than himself when he saw me fall over from the hit. This thing is real, it really is. Electric, yes. This is the animal of the self of God you work with, you are, practitioner of. 
just dropped in from behind a curtain of water through. It's me to let you see the fur of blue stars. It's waved like a Jacob's ladder laying up as an oscillating ocean wrestling distance to dispersal that few get to see, to see their essence naked as could be you, maybe also me, the disjuncture of the carrier dismantled, a moment both message and messenger burn black. I stand by my oath to the crossing. Nothing is over until I shall be free. That grinding vibrato at the end of their pained most notes in a song that the deepest blues singers don't pretend, pretend not being shaken into wrong sound. This abstract truth is not fined out, shaken into the open. Nina Simone declares, God damn, Mississippi, in time with not a beat missed, no blow left out of that tone. Randy Crawford drowns herself out, a subway, under her pale like a subway, like a taxi, a street life. An earth kit drips it like diamond, cafe au lait, spit in your face, nigga back from Paris with rights. Josephine, shake your bananas. She lets you know hers are carrots. The white monkeys don't stop no show. That's it, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to unmute Ray or ask her to unmute as well. That was a fabulous reading. We're very grateful for your poetry and for your reading to us today. And much to be learned from your work. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank everybody. Thanks for being thank you, here. Ed. That was wonderful. Thank you.